This is Andrew from FX Medicine. We thank you so much for your support over the last two years. We'd really love to remain clinically relevant to your practice. So if you know of an expert in some area, please let us know. You can contact us on fxmedicine.com.au, Facebook or Twitter. This podcast was proudly brought to you by the Bioceutical Seminar Series, Reprogramming Autoimmunity. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining me once again in the studio is my good friend, Dr. Mark Donahoe, an esteemed general physician of some, ooh, years, (laughs) (laughs) and who specialises in complex conditions which present with patients who have been through the ringer and finally present to Mark's practice. So welcome back, Mark, to FX Medicine. That makes me sound so old. I, I'm embarrassed yes, it now. it does. It is. Now, today we're going to be talking about one of your, it, it is one of your passions, helping people that have really been through the ringer and finally end up on your doorstep, confused, bewildered, tired, worn out, mm-hmm. and still sick. And this paradigm, I, I guess, the, to put it in a little black box, well, let's call it chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm. I know it's so much more than that. It's, a, it's not just more than that. It's a whole lot of things packed into that box. It's like, mm. you know, shirts and undies and everything, and you just call it clothes. And chronic fatigue syndrome is a group of disorders and a group of adaptive responses and a group of some is pathology, some is adaptation. And when the common factor is unresolving fatigue over a long period of time, then we tend to call it chronic fatigue syndrome. But I think it's, you know, it's a bunch of very individual conditions. And and this was indeed the medical issue years ago, decades ago. Like I remember when, gosh, this is early 90s, it was first called ME. Mm. Uh, now I'm going to get this wrong, myalgic myeloencephalitis. Myalgic right? encephalomyelitis. Encephalomyelitis. I knew I'd get it wrong. Yeah, the, just, that's the E, and, not the M. And believe it or not, that's come back again. So there, oh, really? there is a history of this. There okay. is, you know, there is the old, you know, as many work critics will tell you, there was neurasthenia in the 19th yeah. century. There yeah. was, you know, what the artists suffered for their art. And, and you know, I, I will agree. I have an unusually sensitive group of people who are these patients. It is far, far more typical for them to be artists, writers, creative type people, highly sensitive, sensorily sensitive. And I can see where this concept came of neurasthenia of a kind of oversensitive nervous system that was subject to all kinds of derangement or difficulties and the artist struggling against the fatigue, the depression, the mood changes. That, that arises, that concept of the artist arises for some reason. Now, the majority of the people that I see are not artists mm. anymore. Yeah, I was mm. just going to say, but that, that sort of talk is speaking of what we used to call histrionic yes. behaviour in the 1950s. But, <laughs> but I've met type A personalities oh, God. that are just sick of it and just yeah. want an answer. Funnily enough, I, I do think what happens often is a person finds the wrong niche for themselves. They may be good at it. They may be good at, uh, you know, f- finances and doing 24-hour-a-day um, online share trading and all of those things. They find something they're good at, but there's still very often that kind of unexpressed other side of them. These are people who come from artistic families. I, you know, I think of a, a kind of continuum. On the one side, politicians that are like rock-like and you know, a nuclear blast, they're still going to be there. They will have no idea why anyone With else will. With a smile will, on yeah, will expect, Well, they'll still be hugging babies even if the babies are gone. <laughs> yeah, if the, but, and at the, the other end, you it. have the highly super sensitive artists for whom every minor disturbance of their environment, you know, plays out in their health. And I, I do see a range of people for whom the adaptive response doesn't allow them to retain their good health. I, truly, a lot of the politicians, researchers, the type A personalities, they go and go and go and have no awareness of what what sensitivity is all about until they crash. Mm. And then suddenly they become aware of another side of themselves. Or really? They are, yeah. They're super sensitive to sound, taste, touch, uh, uh, even these days electromagnetics. And they find that it was almost an ignored part. The nervous system's really capable of keeping things at bay until the walls break down. And then that sensory hypersensitivity, that over-responsiveness, often triggered by immune attacks, often triggered by, say, an Epstein-Barr virus or a 
um, you know, streptococcal gut type problems. There's something that breaks down those walls mm. and every person is not a simplistic type A or type B. Every person is a combination of, you know, their experiences, their soft side, their hard side, their, what they're capable of. And a mismatch for a person in their world is very frequently the thing that makes the biggest change to their life at the end. They become somebody else. A lot of my patients leave the careers that contributed to a lot of their health problems, find something that's more in keeping with them and maintain a very good state of health for many years after, but without actual recovery. Like in medicine, we think of recovery as you have pneumonia. We give you antibiotics. You don't have pneumonia. Goodbye. You're on your way and you are now cured and you don't have anything else to do. And these types of illnesses, these adaptive illnesses are not the same type of thing. A cure doesn't look the same. People don't get a drug and get over their chronic fatigue syndrome. And we try and categorize them. You know, we try and put them in Lyme disease, chemical sensitivities. We try and say chronic Epstein-Barr virus or Coxsackie. But we all know that this is just the initiating factor. This is something that allowed a wall to break down and then the immune system, nervous system, gut, all of them start to interact in odd ways. They find a new stable state of health, but it's certainly not what they had before. It's not the kind of lively, productive body that they had previously. Now, I remember a, a television show that you were on, mid-90s, early 2000s maybe, um, and there was a doctor saying, this chronic fatigue syndrome does not exist, and mm. it's all psychosomatic. Yeah. And you were arguing, I might say very eloquently, and that was when I first took took notice of you notice as a speaker. That I became eloquent on the TV. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> eloquent, Mark. Um, but you eloquently fought basically back and saying, "No, you're wrong. These people are real, and they have an yeah. issue. And just because you think it's in their head, doesn't mean that it's not in their body as yes. well as their head." Um, but I guess the issue with medicine is that because they couldn't very easily see any pathology. They said, well, it doesn't exist. I can't see, mm. you know, I'm a, I, I, therefore, I can't see it, therefore it doesn't exist. Yeah. So I, the doubting Thomas, if you like. I have had to gain a new perspective. I mean, medicine, remember, we are taught recognition of pathology, identification of disease. Yeah. We name our diseases yeah. according to the pathology. And so the very training that we go through makes us want to say, what's your symptoms and signs? Let's discard the irrelevant Let's come back and find out what the pathology is showing us about the one item that's causing your problem and let's attack that problem. Yeah. And so the concept of disease, this kind of nosological determination of something, we name it because what we do works. And we have a nice closed system where if you have a disease that we know about, we know a treatment for it, we apply that treatment and that disease state is exited. And that's a, a very, very powerful model. Mm. What happens with illness? What happens with fatigue? What happens with discomfort? Yeah. When you do your first set of pathology tests and you say, well, this will be thyroid or it'll be adrenal or it will be infection or it will be HIV. Well, the other, the other, the other thing is you say nothing detected, but the other thing is actually that NAD, no abnormality detected. Yeah. Well, Which that it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. No. And that's... Things that's are often missed exactly, on, even on standard pathology. Yeah, that's exactly true. We do our pathology to confirm our diagnosis of disease. Our concepts of disease change over time and what we're recognizing now is that there is pathology that is separated from disease mm. states. So a mm. person who is unwell can either fall into a disease state where we treat them pretty well. You know, we know what the disease is. They go to hospital, they have an operation, they have a, their treatment and they come out the other side with a, uh, with a cure of sorts. What we're not good at recognizing is the person in a chronic stable state of ill health where they've adapted. So the adaptive response stops our pathology test from showing, oh, there's the item, we'll go after that. So a good example is um, teenage kids in their HSC year under high pressure, kissing for the first time maybe, but they get yep. Epstein-Barr yep, virus and they get a absolutely classical glandular fever. And the majority of those people, you expect them to come out of it, say, four to six weeks later, and they're well. You know, they come out the other side. Four to six weeks loss in a high school certificate yeah, here is not, disastrously disastrous. stressful. Mm. And so that stress prolongs the illness. The person falls behind. They don't succumb to the disease states of Epstein-Barr. So in Africa, you get Burkitt's lymphoma and in, you know, nasopharyngeal carcinomas are common with post-Epstein-Barr in, um, in Asia. 
they don't fall into the disease category where a doctor would say, oh, I know what you've got. You've got a classic complication of it. What they fall into is a stable state of lousy health, which doesn't let them fall right off the edge. Nothing fatal is going to happen. But, but they cycle at a lower ebb. Yeah, but here's the trick. The body, in adapting to a altered state like that, sacrifices function in order to preserve life. Very good trait. See, I love the way you you put this into a practical sense. Yeah. So they, your body, in trying to recover, trying to um, retain some resilience, puts you down into that lower cycle. Yeah. Well, what we Almost understand, as a protective mechanism. yeah, what we understand is that's what goes on when you get the flu or glandular fever in the first the place. Everyone yeah. goes to bed. Yeah. You can hardly move, and the body diverts all its resources to one thing, and so the loss of function then perfectly explainable. We have no problems with it. Where the problem arises is the failure of resolution. Yeah. Means that that stable state of ill health starts to occur. And my view is my profession handles stable ill health very, very yeah, poorly. poorly yeah. And that includes things like arthritis. We want to treat it as though there's an enemy to be beaten with a drug and a bullet that's going to shoot that enemy down. And the fact is, once a person's entered that stable state of health, you have to identify the components. You have to go back to basics and say, well, now, you know, before you could get away with lousy sleep in the HSC year, now you actually need to sleep your 12 hours a day. Mm. You cannot sacrifice your diet. You cannot get away with the junk food at that point because you require recovery. The failure of recovery, I, I, I've argued this for a long while and I was not popular at various times, but after 35 years in the area of chronic fatigue syndrome and its various nomenclatures, I'm pretty convinced that CFS is that stable state of ill health. We had an idea of homeostasis in the in university we got taught, you're in a bowl. Yep. You go close to the edge of the bowl, our job as doctors is to stop you falling out the other side, which is called death. Mm. Our bowl is, and then if you don't do anything else, you'll fall back into the bottom of it, and that's a stable state of good health. And life is more complicated. It's like a kind of lava flow where there's lots of states of crappy health, which are you adapt to but don't die from. And getting a person out of that is a really, really difficult job. Getting pneumonia better is a doddle. You give the antibiotic, you don't do anything else, give a bit of physiotherapy, and the pneumonia results. But if that pneumonia results in a persistent fatigue state, we don't just have the mindset to think about how to drag a person out of that and get them back to health. So this is where I need to ask a question about what differentiates somebody that just recovers from these stressors, because many people have these stressors. Sure. What's the differentiate or, or differentiators between those people that recover and that was a horrible time and see you later on back on board mm. and chronic fatigue? Or yeah. how does that differentiate from... PTSD, from uh, tired all the time syndrome, mm. or from teaspoon of cement, please. You know, like, how does it... Hang how on, the d- teaspoon of cement. <laughs> well, not... it's not a syndrome. Okay, it's a man thing. <laughs> 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 but, 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 like, how, how do you differentiate between PTSD, chronic fatigue... Right. Um, you know... Th- something sinister that might be causing fatigue, yeah. like cancers? Well, uh, here's the thing. Medicine's pretty good. Most of the people that I see have been through specialists who thought maybe it's cancer, maybe it's diabetes, maybe it's something. Right. And so I have the luxury of seeing plenty of people, the vast majority, who've been through all kinds of doctors without identifying disease. Yeah. And so I can be reasonably confident that these very clever people who are very good at identifying diseases and have said, no, there is none there, I can be pretty confident that those diseases aren't there. I think the fascination for me is, and the reason why I have three hour, two or three hour initial consultations is the person's story, their background, their family history, the traumas they had in early life, the timing of the onset of the illness, what happened in the six months before, they're all critical players. And then you've got the Richie Shoemaker group who say, and there's another dimension and that's genetics, right? So Richie's moved on from just the mycotoxins to chronic inflammatory response. Oh, right. So the CIRS, the chronic inflammatory response syndrome, they've identified little HLA-DRB1, HLA-DQ groups that seem to be highly susceptible to molds, that seem to be highly susceptible to fungal infections, to uh, bacterial infections like Lyme. And their answer would be, well, look, only, you know, three or four percent of the population has these particular genes, which will make your mouldy house go off like a firecracker. The 97 percent are going to recover, and that's what we doctors see as the recovered people, the people who just have a bit of allergy to the mould and then go on and get better. But there's a group for whom 
It's a life and death struggle. They have an over-aggressive immune response to particular circumstances, or they have failures of easing up on that immune response, difficulties in letting go. And so what he's identified, and I think really valuably, although it's taking time to tease the genetics apart, is that there are subgroups for whom running into your nemesis is the problem. Yeah. That if you run into glandular fever and you're the stock standard person, you'll typically get over it. But if the HSC is on and the stresses are going up and you've got a particular type of DRB1 and you're eating gluten and you've got a DQG. And this is where medicine does not do well with multiple no. factories, uh, uh, multiple factors. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think what we're good at is one cause, one outcome, one treatment. Mm. And I think that we've picked that apart. You now have, you know, psychosocial, I would, I would say indeed it's not, not medicine, it's man. <laughs> well, it's not just medicine. See, it, it is man a, isn't good. At man, that, maybe. Right? Women do, right? That's yeah. the thing, that, <laughs> the thing that I get is mothers come in with their children and understand this deeply. They know the story of the child that's got sick. They know it, in, not just intuitively, but it's in the biology. When we develop a scientific system of classification, we put artificial boundaries around, okay, this is called pneumonia. This is called stroke. This is called heart attack. Mm. And we have our boundaries and then we have the support system of pathology to confirm or deny our simplified categories. Yeah. Yeah. Does a person have a heart attack in isolation? No, they don't. Some are lousy methylators. They've got high homocysteine. They've had it for years. Some people have uh, chronic inflammation with fibrinogen very high. You get a whole range of subtleties that we lump together in one group, call it a heart attack. Why? Because we have stents and we have cabbages and we have ways of treating that and it suits us to wait for the final pathology to express itself because there's an efficiency. It's either you die, bad luck, or you get our technology costly. We all make money. We all drive our BMWs and we all go home thinking that we've done a lot of good. The missing part of medicine is paying attention to the stories that lead a person towards illness and that we just haven't listened to the story. Our mums come in and tell me the story of their kids. It's great when I see 80-year-old mums coming in telling, them, telling me about their 50-year-old son's story right. about the health problems right. because when I ask the guy, he never said, oh, nothing, I was perfectly healthy. And mothers come in with the whole story, oh, no, we had grommets. You know, we had these problems. We lived in a mouldy house. He was forever sick. He wouldn't know anything about that. So, so you know, I guess here's me doing the human thing about trying to find the answer. And, and naturopaths and natural medicine practitioners have been trying to find the answer for this chronic fatigue syndrome, this chronic fatigue issue for many years, and they've labelled it with different things. And I guess this is where my scepticism comes in, if you like. And, you know, I, I, I saw the move from ME to CFS to multiple chemical sensitivity to, oh, then it was thyroid, then it was vitamin D. And, and, and Lyme disease. Lyme disease and mould. So, so now you're talking genetics. Now, this is where, to me, it gets very interesting. Um, and... You know, my, my caution is we want to find the answer, so we're going to go, that's the answer. Yeah. And it may not be the answer, but it might give a clue yeah. to the answer. Is that – am I on the right I track? Think, I think you're right. I, well, the way I divide it up, you know, I, I use this uh, this naming of the Gemini, the genetics, environment, microbiome, the intestine, inflammation mm. – um, I, I have a way of thinking about it, which is what are the components that play a part? I think genetics are important. There are some people who are bulletproof. Sadly, they tend to become prime ministers or you know ministers or something, and you can't knock them off if they or get hit by a bullet. <laughs> they are still going to be standing there. Yeah. And there are other people who, for whom life is tenuous mm. in, in the sense that they're never really well, and they go through life having to adapt to that lousy state of marginal health, and eventually something breaks. So one issue is, do you have genetic susceptibility? Simple, really simple things like, are you allergic? Did your mum and dad both have dust bite allergies? Does your mum or dad have particular kinds of health problems? And at least a quarter of what goes on with a person can be identified by just asking in depth, what happened in your family? What's mum and dad? What's brothers and sisters? Half the time the story emerges just simply paying attention to the siblings and the first degree relatives. And then you go back along one line of the family and you see, yeah, well, grandpa died at 49 of a heart attack. Dad died at 52 of a heart attack after having two coronary bypasses. And then we talk about, okay, well, could there be a methylation issue? And there's this homocysteine. 
you can kind of make sense of it going backwards. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're born with is, is almost a little suitcase. It's not that genetics determine our future. It's that they are like a menu. You can only select from what's on that menu and how you get through life depends on what places stresses on those genetic weak spots. You're not dying. You're not dying before you're born. So all of the genetic failures never made it through childhood. So you have to have made it that far. Later on, does life find your weak spots and do those weak spots get played out? Now, the classic would be the highly mold reactive person Mm. who never knows it and is living perfectly healthily. And then they get to university, a moldy old room, and they're living in that room and their health just disintegrates over, you know, a three to six month period. When they've got that added stressor of uni life and And, perhaps an infection. And truthfully, we're really, really healthy in all the way before. This is not mold allergy. Mm. This is a much more aggressive immune response. And so they get into the room. They're still young. The body says, okay, well, we can fix that with a bit of cortisone. So the the adrenals start to function at a bit higher rate and the cortisone keeps the inflammation under control and they proceed on and on and on. For a while. For a while. And then time, the, the problem with cortisol is it's what's called a catabolic hormone. It does preserve health, mm. but it sense. sacrifices yeah. function. Mm. And that sacrifice of function is in mental function, short-term memory, concentration, weakness and fatigue, mitochondrial function. And as those things start to collapse, the person becomes progressively more vulnerable. Typically, there's an event, one side of which they say, oh, no, it's pretty well okay, and the other side of which they say, I definitely was not okay. And that's where we identify the rapid onset chronic fatigues. The chronic fatigue syndrome, which a person will say, I was good until I got glandular fever. I was still good until, you know, there was a a rush of water through the place and it got all moldy. And they identify a point. There's a different group of people for whom health was never, ever good. From childhood, they were subject to infections. They were weak and fatigued, grew poorly, couldn't play sport. And I see those as very different people. One of them is highly, say, susceptible to infections forever on antibiotics, forever on treatment for their cough scolds, their tonsillitis, their middle ear infection, grommets and the whole story. And they were lucky to make it through childhood. But we in medicine don't let them die anymore. These are not weakened yeah. in the now sense this... that they would fall off their perch. Yeah. We are very careful to make sure every life is precious. But that means there's a lot of lives that are not resilient that we have to keep on propping up. And the medical intervention is not without its cost. There's about 10 billion questions flying around my head Mm. right now, so hopefully I can remember them to ask you. First one, did this sort of chronic fatigue syndrome happen 50, 60, 70 years ago? I know that we weren't reporting on it. It would Mm. have been called sensitive. It would have been called meek. It would have been labelled as something because we were a lot a lot more regimented in stiff upper lip, getting on with the job, that sort of thing back then. We didn't have these nuances. We didn't have these niceties of caring for people these days. What was the it medical called? system of today, at least in Australia, is is designed really to care for sick people, right? Yeah. Chronically sick people. And we can get into a political argument here, but, but I just, I, I'm thinking about the human animal as yeah. like a bear, you know, if, or a bird. And a bird just wouldn't get to mate with a female because they'd go, go away. <laughs> Whereas humans, we, we look after and, and nurture the sick. And right. I, this is such a, an inflammatory comment, I know. I but know. but it's, it's almost like we're, we're mollycoddling the weaker people. I, I know this is, this is such an inflammatory we comment. Should, we should discuss this, right? Uh, there is an important question. We all regard evolution as the best model of successful selection of life on earth. What we forget is medicine by its nature is anti-evolutionary. Yeah. It's survival of the richest yeah. oh. and survival of the weakest. And so we have changed the evolutionary process where there was what we would call as humans wastage, you know, babies being born that were never going to survive. Yeah. A 27 year old was 27 week old delivery could not make it. It was just an impossibility. And now Every life is precious and we put our resources into the maintenance of that because we've become richer and more capable and much cleverer at keeping those babies alive. Is there a cost? Of course there is. I mean, the cost is that evolution was a vicious bastard of a thing. <laughs> yeah. you, didn't, you didn't make it, you didn't mate, genes But got it's a deleted. horrible thing to say if you're the mother of or father of that It's not a horrible thing, thing to talk about, right? Mm. The, the tragedy of loss 
happens equally with car accidents. You know, we put up with, True. you know, 400, 500, 600 deaths. We put up with deaths in er various areas, but we have found it horrendous that any baby that could possibly live doesn't live. Mm. You know, the mm. babies are the precious. And mm. in evolutionary terms, you're not precious until you get on to being able to mate with the next generation. But this this was part of the marketing. You know, Siemens had an ad many, many years ago, back in the 80s, of survival of the weakest. You know, we are now the species that will have the survival yes. of the weakest. Yes. What they didn't mention is you had to be rich to be part of that survival of the weakest. Well, not with Medicare in Australia, though. Well, you have to be richer it's, than you are in Africa. Yeah. So survival right. of the weakest in yeah. Africa and sub-Saharan areas. Yeah. And if you are black in various communities in almost any country, yes. if mm. you've got white skin and you are oldish and you have children who are privileged, you generally are going to be in one of those nations where medical care is going to prop you up. I'm not saying at all this is a bad thing. I think we just need to recognise that there are plenty of us alive today who could not have been alive without mm. medical intervention. Mm. What's the cost of that? The cost of that is you get a type of anti-evolutionary selection process. The, the richest tend to be able to afford care that the poorest cannot. There is still a vigorous evolution going on in many, many countries. Starvation, war, disease, it decimates whole populations and death and loss is not uncommon, whereas it's become almost uh, obscene for a baby to die, mm. any baby mm. to die ever mm. under any circumstances. And so we have to at least have that conversation to say, well, we're doing an anti-evolutionary selection process. Are we comfortable with that? The costs are going to be high. The evolutionary costs of how do genes propagate? Do they persist over a period of time? Now they can. Points before in the past, they may not have been able to. So we, we are aware of what we're doing. The question is, are we prepared for it to be any different? The new thing is the CRISPR technologies. We have weak genes, so if we just repair the genes for future generations, they'll be better off and humans will dominate. We are, don't like to go down the line of saying, are we actually the most important species around? Oh, right? The yeah. deep one is, have humans got a greater right to exist than every other animal? And they're kind of... Social evolutionists say, yes, we've developed a big enough brain. We own this earth. What we're recognizing in this last two decades is we are part of a biosystem that we depend on as much as they may depend on us yeah. not buggering it up. Yeah. And every time this argument comes up of global warming and crop failures and everything else, people make the mistake of saying this is the end of the world. This isn't the end of the world. This is the end of the people who buggered up the world. And we may have massive problems with disease and difficulty in managing that care because of the way we've had lousy um, maintenance of our planet. But it ain't the end of the world. The bugs that no. are in our bowel <laughs> are going to construct new hosts <laughs> somewhere in the get future. Back to bugs. Yeah, they are. But they're going to construct new hosts. They're pretty, yeah. you know, the methanogens and the archaea, they're called extremophiles for a reason. They could cope with any bloody thing. And so what, what, what I think we need to be aware of is we're doing an evolutionary selection process. We do disease management. We keep people alive and keep babies alive that could not have made it. We have the consequences of that to live with. And now the integrative medicine concept is maybe we could identify something and prevent those problems from arising to take the load off a medical system so that the weaknesses that we've just said, well, they're inherent, they're God-given, you know, how can you do anything about it? We're now talking about, well, we can identify the poor methylators. We can identify those who shouldn't be eating grains. We can do little bits and pieces, which at the very least stop the trap doors from opening once you've kind of launched your way on life. And I, I think, I think that untangling the complexity of chronic fatigue syndrome is a much bigger thing than chronic fatigue syndrome. It's how do you get vigorous, resilient health back in a person who's only just scraping by. We don't let them die. They're not even near death, but they're non-functioning. And that sacrifice of function for survival is not really what I would call good health. So getting back to that chronic fatigue measurement, mm. When you're talking about this concept of resilience and um, preserving quote unquote health at the expense of function, mm. do we need to be looking at, say, measuring the hormonal response or reserves, call it a reserves, I don't know how you'd say you've got a full tank, you've got an empty one, but do we need to be looking at something like how your hormones are reacting to the world, but also measuring things like 
hippocampal volume. I'm really mm. interested in the world in the work of uh, David, Dr. David Hasse and Professor Dale Bredesen here. Now, David Hasse is working with chronic fatigue and anxious people, mm. and more than that. But but I'm talking, let's say, inorganic disease. Um, whereas Professor Dale Bredesen is working with organic type disease, yeah. and I just see it as a really interesting. Let's call it a thought, you know, a tool to be able to measure the volume of the response of a part of the brain to say, if it's shrunk, you're now wasting away. Do you reckon that's where we need to go? Or do, like, are we I, there I yet? Know, look, I, uh, this again is Richie Shoemaker and his group doing mm. neuroquant measurements. They're measuring the size of, you know, where's the amygdala oh, okay. and the hippocampal yep. size. And they're, they're using MRI scans that do particularly clever measurements. David's using the QEEG to look at the brainwave patterns, the the effect on that end organ. I think we, we've overvalued the brain, right? The brain was an accident. We don't listen to music because that ha enhanced survival value. The brain got very complicated and, in fact, in many ways a little bit overcomplicated. And the brain is a receptor organ. It is more gland than it is thinking machine. The brain does all the sampling, what's going wrong, okay, up the, uh, up the um, uh, cortisol, down the testosterone, but, you know, little manipulations like this. And our endocrine system, I don't think of as the measurement that makes the most sense to us. It's the adaptive system. The endocrine system is eternally having the brain say, whoop, the thyroid's a little bit low, pick the metabolic rate up. And so the message goes out yep. by a two-step process. And that adaptive response in the brain, you would expect the brain to respond to the external environment and brain volume changes, brain activity changes. We are seeing this much more now that we've got a concept of neuroinflammation, which is measurable. So we have the SPECT scans and we have the functional MRIs. We are seeing brain changes that we would regard as organic changes of the brain mm. in people with fatigue syndrome, but post-traumatic stress disorder, chronic anxiety states. So there is no longer a mind-brain division the brain and the mind and the psyche seem to flow in a whole person. And although we have this, you know, biopsychosocial model, what we're not seeing is we're not seeing whole people. Yeah. I, I think that the brain is an important part of it because when you come to things like, I'm not remembering things, I'm finding it hard to concentrate, we have a model in medicine which is, oh, I've got a pill for that. We can up the monoamines, we can down the serotonin. And that was indeed the, the only treatment available for quote-unquote chronic fatigue before it was accepted. Sure. Oh, it's in a de depressive syndrome, there's a de an antidepressant. Yeah, and, uh, and now, you know, since uh, FDA in America ran some surveys a couple of years ago, now there is much more of a focus on neuroinflammation. And we've heard that at the biocidical seminars over the last couple of years, yeah. that what modifies neuroinflammation? You know, what can we do? That RG3 and some of the curcuminoids and the like, there is a fascinating interaction of what we mm. eat with how the brain is functioning, yeah. mediated via the vagus nerve and via the hormones and the immune system. And it's getting more and more difficult to separate those systems. The, the kind of tenure of medicine of we have specialties and therefore we know what is wrong with your brain, your mind or anything else, I think it's over. You've got now specialists isolated, not able to find disease states in very sick people only because they're not talking together. And you've got the job falling back to naturopaths and GPs and primary carers who get to know the whole person over a period of time and untangle that little web. I should describe what I was saying before about we sacrifice uh, function for structure. When stresses arise, we produce cortisol in response to those stresses. Yep. Cortisol is catabolic in the sense that it sacrifices nitrogen, but it also triggers off the so-called stress proteins, what were previously called heat shock proteins. What's a heat shock protein? When the body is under stress, it pulls back function in an almost hibernating response to, to invoke a protein structure that will save the cells from damage. And so it's like we've got cells of the pituitary, the, the uh, thyroid, everything busily functioning away. When a threat arises, we close up shop. The structural proteins stabilize those cells, but what you sacrifice is function. If that's for a winter, that's a great trade, right? Because you get through winter, you survive to the other end. So yeah. stress proteins are not stressed in the sense of I'm, I'm distressed about something. They are ways of getting through a terrible period of time and getting out the other end. 
The problem is that cortisol, while very good in the short term for getting you through that winter, that yeah. starvation, that whatever it is, yeah. that infection, mm -hmm. when it starts to become low grade long term, you sacrifice the function in the long term. And people are different from cats and dogs. No cat ever complained of sleeping 20 hours a day. No, <laughs> no. rat ever complained of it. They reduce Indeed, their hibernating function. animals. This is where I was sort of getting my interest is. Yeah, I, I have a real interest in this because, you know, we all know of T3 and T4. Mm. Um, in the thyroid, there is a T0 and a T1 and a T2. The hibernating response is tied up very, very intimately with how we manipulate our thyroid. And we focus on the T3 and T4 because there's receptors for those. We say that governs your metabolic rate. But the T1s, 2s and 0s and the T0 being, you know, a, a very special variant of tyrosine in the central nervous system is a signal for a mammal to go into hibernation. Now, we've never even started looking at that. We have an interest in the very powerful end um, receptor triggers and so we consider hypothyroidism, anything where the T3 or the T4 drops down below an area and the brain saying, quick, give me more. But what if the brain is not saying, give me more? What do doctors do? We do a TSH test. Mm. What if the brain is saying, no, hibernation is the best way of getting through this terrible brain. Right, right. And so you don't get the TSH, you get a clearly hypothyroid person. The doctors are testing for the thyroid and saying, your TSH is normal. What does that mean? It's saying the brain doesn't want you to produce any more of that. Why would it not? One answer is, well, you have thyroiditis. So a lot of people who are gluten sensitive get thyroiditis. The damaged gland sends the signal back, going, this is not good to be overproducing. And so you say, okay, we'll settle it down. We'll, we'll stop that inflammation by not stimulating the thyroid any further. And the other way is chronic infection. If you've played your best shots with the immune system, run temperatures of 38 degrees and never got through it, the next best thing you can do is not bugger things up too quickly. And so you back off the metabolic rate. I routinely get people to measure their temperatures. And most of the people who have this chronic brain fag post-infectious, they are not running a temperature. They're running low. They're running in the mid 35s. Right. And you can say that's the best conservative thing you can do. The body only says, I've got to get through the next period of time. It can't make the long-term decisions about what's the next five years about. The general thing for evolution was you've got to get through window. You've got to get through starvation. You've got to get through something acute like an infection. And if you didn't make it, you were wolf meat anyway. Mm. You've mentioned thyroid, which, you know, I mentioned was, you know, one of those ah answers, it's all thyroid. Mm. You also mentioned cortisol. And indeed, this was a, a very large um, movement, if you like, in Australia, with particularly with integrative GPs. Cortisol was the answer to everything. Mm. Um, and yet I really did twig. A light bulb went on when Dr. Andrew Heyman spoke about this, this in the symposium of 2016, mm. saying, don't just give a Band-Aid until you uncover why yeah. they're low. This is so, the critical difference between medicine and integrated medicine. Yeah. The biggest difference is if we fail to ask the question why, then we've failed. So how do you ask the correct why? Well, to me, that's the point of the history. The why a person get, gets unwell is tied up into what were the precursors, what's their family history, what's yep. their environment. Yep. You look at what's around them. The whole Hippocratic, Hippocratic version of humanity was the person in their world, with their diet, in their environment, that you pay attention to all of the factors on one side and you don't just say, what is the disease state? What is the name of this illness mm. on the other side? So the failure to ask why, I, this is a pet peeve of mine. So many... I've got to say mine too. <laughs> ...complementary <laughs> practitioners want to be doctors and have tricks that are as powerful as the drugs we use. Doctors problem is that they've got powerful drugs without ever answering the question why. So you can got get, time. Yeah, you can get an answer that gets the person out of your room and gets them through yep. another month yep. and then they're back again. Yeah. And we there's almost a business model of that. If you never deeply ask why a person's sick, you will see that person over and over and over again. And it used to be that naturopaths and complementary practitioners spent the time got to advise people on, you know, their sleep, their diet, all the things that we kind of regarded as too wussy yeah. in medicine. It wasn't yeah. really strong enough. Yeah. Now what's medicine doing? It's coming to, oh, well, hang on, sleep, diet, lifestyle, sitting down at a table. There are things 
that we're trying to become more kind of complementary and pay attention to these things. We don't do it well because it's not in a 15-minute consultation. At the same time, you've got the complementary practitioners wanting to be using herbs and pills as powerful and as quick as a doctor does, and in a sense, giving up the high moral ground of, I will go into your life and we will together discover what is going wrong, why these things are happening. Mm. So to me, medicine answers what and what do I do in the short term and has very, very few good long-term answers. And the integrative approach should really be, let's do that job and do it properly, but then come back to the why. Why did you ever get into that state of health? Lots of people with chronic fatigue syndrome want to get a quick answer and mm. they try, oh, coenzyme Q10 and alpha lipoic acid agents, yeah. and magnesium, they're good for mitochondria. I tried that. And what often happens, and you'll see this, uh, it happens also when doctors try and give a thyroid hormone when the TSH is not high, is the person will initially get a bound of energy and then it sits straight back into the, yep. the mold that it was before. And they'll yep. say, I was good for a week there, but then it all fell back into a hole. Because your body's preserving health at yep. the expense of function. And the least worst outcome. So this is the thing in evolutionary biology is biology goes for what's the least worst thing that it can happen. Not what's the best thing, not is how do I get to a concert next week or go on a trip to Japan to go skiing. Uh, these are not biological concepts. It's what's the thing least likely to see me sick at some time in the future and the, like, the thing least likely to let me die. We don't die now, partly because we are better educated, we are well fed, we're, there's a whole lot of things. Predators are not high <laughs> in the urban environment or things that eat humans are just not around all that much. Yeah. Banks. <laughs> <laughs> but those are the new predators. Yeah, yeah. The new predator is what preys on your mind. The electricity companies. Yeah, what preys on your wallet, what preys on other things. And what we failed to notice is that while we've got out of the fatal stresses of something eating us, we have not got out of the fatal stresses of cardiovascular accumulation of plaque. So are we seeing more today? I mean, we're obviously more observant nowadays and, and we like to measure things these days and we mm. like to say, oh, there's a new thing. But are we seeing more chronic fatigue, tired all the time syndromes because we have this preponderance for the new quote unquote performance? I mean, you know, kids today are so involved in competitiveness with not sports, yeah. unfortunately. It's more like games or schoolwork. Or school. You know, and, and, and the, the, you know, that's tied into economic success. Yeah. I will say that from my experience, I'm seeing younger and younger people where the pressure is on earlier and earlier. Yeah. And so there is a definite thing happening and it's an, I believe, a really unfortunate thing. So are you thing. seeing earlier and earlier onset of CFS? I am, but it tends to still be in the late years of uh, high school. And there, I mean, I've had some kids recently, one 10 years ago, th go through the high school certificate here in New South Wales and one more recently, just last year. The pressure has gone up enormously. What has the medical profession done? A lot of the medical profession says, oh, your child is not performing because of attention deficit autism. We have pills for that. There is a whole system of making children into pre-adult functional machines that they have to get over this hill called the higher school certificate. They have mm. to get into university. They need to make money. And we are fueling a process which is just inappropriate for some of those kids. And maybe even the majority of those kids, when you see what happens in the eastern suburbs here in Sydney, whole families end up on Ritalin or Dexam, uh, Dexamphetamines. Yep. Whole families end up on it with the idea that, oh, you have a, a little broken bit in the brain and amphetamines will fix that. And so we come back to children who are then being pushed. Instead of allowing them to recover, yep. we push them harder so that they function at a higher rate. And I, I don't think time. that for a period of mm. time, and then when they crash, we say, oh, poor Gillian or poor Robert yep. couldn't take the heat. And it's not that there should be heat at that time. This is childhood. You're meant to be adaptive, learning the skills, finding out what your nemesis is, getting to the other side of it. I, I just don't think we respect the fact that the diet, nutrition, the sleep, all of those things that contribute to health are now optional extras in the game of you have to get an HSC result that will make your life profitable in the future. And that pressure is just unbelievable in my mind. A couple of points. One was just a little while ago, you were mentioning about the, you know, the, the importance of the history. Mm. And I just started to, to wonder about that in 
that chronic fatigue, yeah. as a quote, uh, as a diagnosis, if you like, to me appears to be one but one presentation of the chronic stress or, or, an, or, or an early stress or in life. What I'm going back here is, you know, the, the, the lady that develops Crohn's during the, the late teens with hormonal births, yes. and then there's a stress or whack, she develops Crohn's. Then you'll get somebody else that develops anxiety. Then you'll get somebody else that I, I remember she'd seen um, endocrinologists, gynecologists, and it was really interesting that nobody had ascertained that there was a, an interesting link. All of this woman's weight issues seems to occur from the time that she had a hysterectomy mm. years ago. And now she's got a thyroid disorder mm. that she's being treated um, by an endocrinologist. So, and it was just interesting that it seemed to start at that. An orthodox practitioner wouldn't accept that. Yeah. An integrative practitioner would probably look into that as at least being interesting and probably yeah. um, one factorial cause. Yeah, you, you I just think it's interesting. Thing, though, that straw that breaks the camel's back. Yeah, is but not often just in chronic fail. fatigue. Yeah, well, often what we focus on is what's the event that immediately yeah. preceded it. Yeah. I think that the the real difficulty, the real art of this is to go back deeply into the person's life. What were they like as a youngster? That takes a hell of a lot to unravel. But the early childhood stresses, uh, sexual abuse is a very, very important mm. thing for many, many of the people who later develop these chronic illnesses. Yeah. And untangling post-traumatic stress disorder from anxiety, from depression. So how do you do that? Let's... Well, I, I well, do look, I mean, in my own practice, I take that history and it gives me an idea of where I should be looking. Having a celiac somewhere in the family is always a, a little bit of a, you know, a call to attention of mm. what is going on with the gut and the diet. Um, having thyroid disease very, very commonly is those DQ2 and DQ8 genes, give them enough wheat for a while and 50% and or 60% yep. of the women end up with thyroiditis. So I've been to conferences where integrative doctors say, look, if they've got thyroiditis, they're wheat sensitive and it's probably gluten. But it's, that's 50, 60%, not 80 yeah, I know. So that's a, so, that's a toy. I know. A coin there toss. are other things that go on with those kind of people as well. But so I still, you know, in untangling chronic fatigue syndrome, the primary job is if you've got the time to go back over a deep history mm. and you've got the time to find out what family members did and what the history of that person is. And I'll tell you now, the majority of the people that I see, it is I had lots and lots of infection as a child. I had lots of antibiotics. I had grommets put in my ear. I had my tonsils taken mm -hmm. out and I was well yeah. after the grommets or the tonsils went, except five years later, it's something else. Mm -hmm. And then 10 years later, it's something else. So the typical thing that I see is people highly susceptible to infection. There's a thing called Lewis secretors and non-secretors, 15% of the population. It's the blood group. Well, it's the tissue type. Right. It's a variation uh, of the uh, yeah. Uh, right. It's a variation of the blood grouping. Right. So ABO and uh, and the ABH system are two different systems, but the Lewis non secretors get their bugs and they hang on, and so these are not people who get lots of different infections. They're the ones that once an infection is established, get it over and over. This is the group for whom antibiotics are really bad news. Yeah, yeah. Because what they end up selecting randomly is which bugs live and die, and the pathogens that hold on mean that they get their gut flora wiped out. They get an entire lifetime of stresses that are medical in nature. And we, we as doctors just say, that 10% or so, why don't they get better? And it's a mystery to us. So we, we have a, a contribution to play. We have diet, lifestyle vaccinations. We have everything which plays a part in the health of that person. And we cannot untangle it. Over the last 50 years, everything changed. And when we see these chronic illnesses, we can say, there's contributions that come from all of these areas. And for some people, one event stands out. We pay all our attention on that event, but we pay little attention to the precursors. What is it about them? What's the mismatch between their diet, their sleeping, their environment, their health, their, uh, their lifestyle? What is it that's not matching them? And a lot of the work with chronic fatigue syndrome is to rematch a person to their lifestyle. Here's the simple story. Most of the people I see in the high-pressure jobs end up getting a better life because they choose not to go back to the thing that made a mess of their health to begin with. People pay attention. There's an upside. This is the worst upside to chronic fatigue syndrome, but something as devastating as that illness can play out 
by the person being so sick that they just can't keep on doing what they were doing before. So they change their diet. Mm. They move to exercise. They find their health again. And they're down a notch from where they were, but they match their world better to themselves. And part of the job, I think, as practitioners is to guide them back along that path without being too pushy, you know, mm. pushy, mm. you know, you must do this diet. It's finding where's the comfort point so that their endocrine system says, yeah, okay, I'm matching that outside world a little better. You don't have to treat the low or the high cortisol or the low or the high thyroid. You watch those test results and when you've done something else, the TSH starts to pick itself up again. The thyroid gets back in, the temperature comes up and they're the markers of you having done something else successfully. I'm a big fan of what Andrew Heyman said, that we look at those hormones as the treatable condition. We shouldn't. We should be looking those as the markers of adaptation or maladaptation. And when we've done our job properly, those hormonal markers come back of their own accord. We do have to make sure they don't have Addison's. They don't have, you know, th you know, damaged thyroiditis. We do have to make sure they don't have the diseases. But on the other end of it, the medical model of high intervention to make something happen is less powerful than the model of adapting the world and the environment and letting that person find their space back where those endocrine responses normalize of their own accord. The thing that I love and hate about you, Mark, is that every single sentence of you spark from you sparks about twenty questions. <laughs> and this, I mean, this is obviously a huge topic. So many areas to cover. We haven't even touched on it. We, we've just touched on how to, how to slightly differentiate and what might be some of the causes. Right. So, I'm going to break this now. We're going to uh, what we're going to do is come back if you're amenable to this, and we'll do part two, looking at chronic fatigue syndrome, where we'll look at how to treat, what yeah. are some of the issues with treatment, um, indeed what prognosis do some of these people have? Sure. I'm, I'm happy to do that. 35 years of this means that putting this into 45 minutes is really, <laughs> really difficult. But I think what we've covered is there's a philosophical question. Mm. Is this a disease or is this an adaptation? Medicine treats adaptations like diseases and it does so poorly. If we are coming back at this problem, then what is the meaning of the low thyroid, the low temperature, the meaning of those and what are practical implementations of diet changes, lifestyle, sleep and the like? We can deep dive into some of those things mm. and be far more practical about what does it mean to get the person readapted to their world and allow them to support their and, function? And give some answers to, yeah. in, you know, certainly the practitioners that are treating chronic fatigue people. Yeah. Um, I, that's a bit of a label, people with chronic fatigue, but... Yeah. Um, but also maybe indeed some listeners who might be suffering from chronic fatigue. So I'd I, love to. I, I really I'd look love to. to I mean, just doing this in, in smaller chunks where mm. you can say, okay, here's what this can mean. You know, here when we talk about the thyroid, when we talk about the adrenals, when we talk about testosterone and sex hormones, what does it actually mean? What's the body doing? And, and untangling that, I think, is a podcast all by itself. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today on FX Medicine, please engage with us and let us know what further topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in contact with us through our website, fxmedicine.com.au, or look for FX Medicine in your favourite social media platform. You can also rate and review us on iTunes, and we'd really like to thank those who have already rated us. It's through your continued support that enables us to bring you current, complex and relevant topics to enhance your practice of natural medicine.